Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Here I am speaking from Sao Paulo, Brazil, to the organizers of this Congress, to the speakers present in this panel, and to you participants from many countries. I wish you all an agreeable and beneficial use of our time together and a most enriching exchange. This is the Third World Congress 11th week of activities. We gather here today to talk about trends as embodiment of being, a theme of enormous relevance to the effective exercise of transdisciplinarity. The gap between logic and being has been a major concern in trans research and studies, publications, formative processes since its foundation in 1998. Today, trends as embodiment of being will be approached beginning with renowned studies in the field of neuroscience, principles of transdisciplinary logic, and contemplative, reflexive, and experiential practice. Coming Friday, issues related to humanology, educational futures, art, the science of being will constellate in, in an instigating set of realities where knowledge and being practices are equally valued, nurtured, and unified for human existence to thrive creatively. To address a subject matter of relevance requires a lot of rigor and openness, as well as adequate contextualization. For today's presentation, a selection was made that intends to provide an understanding of the amplitude of this complexity, how challenging it is in actualizing practice. I leave here my gratitude to the speakers and respondents physically present in this panel and to those who due to time zone differences had to record their presentations. I now pass the floor to Susanna Hayes, this week's moderator, who will introduce each of our speakers. I thank her immensely for the careful and judicious work in articulating the week's session theme, in addition to her selection of speakers of today's conference and roundtable, as well as a symposium group that will speak on Friday, February 5th to which you are all invited. Enjoy it and uh, let's keep going. Susanna, it's, the room is all yours. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Maria, very much. And I will go right to our program. Um, Today, um, we are beginning with the experiential portion of the embodiment of being. My name is Susanna Hayes. I am an artist and educator based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I received my MFA at the San Francisco Art Institute and my doctorate at the University of California at Berkeley. I want to thank the Congress leadership, Siret, Basarab Nicolesco, and Florent Pasqua, C-Trans of Brazil, Maria and Victoria, UNESCO, 
Paolo Orfis and Juliet Hadar in Mexico City. I'd also like to thank the Entropy, Entropy Institute in San Francisco for their tremendous support for this particular two-day two conference. Our keynote address will be given by Dr. Stephen W. Porges, followed by our roundtable discussion with Dr. Joseph Aziz and Dr. Joseph E. Brenner, the two Josephs. And we will have uh, invited respondents, Jack Kane, Margarita de Vivero Zuber, and Edward Stack, following each of their presentations. This equation, trans equals embodiment of being, is something that I conceived of to help us understand the gap and the need for balance between logic and being. We've reached a point, I feel, that we can all agree that the transdisciplinary education can no longer afford to teach principles of biology and philosophy without teaching inner engagement practices for directly experiencing feedback loop systems. Logic and being requires reciprocity. Humanity's work is to innerly attend to the evolutionary field of experiencing our existence where perception of mind and body become one action of bi-directional reciprocity. This inner medium of resistance pressures the field of our disparate duality, providing the conditions in which a hidden third force can emerge. Since human evolution naturally agrees with phylogenetic principles, we can ask in the 21st century, how is the transdisciplinary movement assisting an explicit pathway toward revising curricula that engages the principles of science with intuitive contemplative practices? Why do our dual mental, physical, brain, body ways of knowing reject the potential of our hidden third potential? How can education assist our disparate ways of knowing? Each speaker has been invited to bring their understanding of either side of the equation so that we as transdisciplinary educators may more responsibly transmit to humanity the process work of our becoming transdisciplinary beings. Dr. Stephen Porges, our first speaker is a distinguished university scientist at Indiana University and founding director of the Traumatic Stress Research Consortium. President of the Society for Psycho Psychophysiological Research and, and the Federations in Behavioral and Brain Sciences, he has authored numerous articles and lectured extensively about the implications of modern science. In 1994, Dr. Partridge proposed the polyvagal theory, a theory that links the evolution of the mammalian autonomic nervous system to social behavior and emphasizes the importance of physiological state in the expression of behavioral problems and psychiatric disorders. He is the author of the polyvagal theory, the pocket guide to polyvagal theory, and clinical applications of the polyvagal theory. He is also the creator of a music-based intervention, the Safe and Sound Protocol, which is used widely among therapists to improve spontaneous social engagement, reduce hearing sensitivities, assist language processing, and state regulation. In recent years, the polyvagal perspective has spread beyond the field of trauma 
to other disciplines, we as a society are in the process of realizing we communicate through our nervous systems as much as our intellects. Dr. Portis's talk is titled, A Transdisciplinary Theory of Sociality. And it reminds us humans evolved by animal bodies that still inhabit and react to incoming data from both inner and outer environments. Without adaptation through vagal pathway cues, the human body's capacity to become instruments of higher consciousness is unrealizable. And I'll just add that following Dr. Porges's presentation, Margarita de Vivero Zuber will respond with the first question. Thank you, Dr. Porges, very Thank much you. for being with us today. It's my pleasure. And now to do the Zoom challenge of screen sharing. First, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this conference. Um, for me, uh, I learned in preparing this talk that I am a, what we say, a closet transdisciplinarian, that my world has always been uh, bridging. I just didn't realize how much it was bridging until I tried to prepare this talk. So this is a new type of talk for me to give because my normal audience is either grand rounds doing science presentations at universities or scientific organizations or dealing, trying to communicate through another transdisciplinary manner with clinicians and educators. So I'm just going to try. This is the first time I'm doing this. So one thing we need to know that as we start talking about this journey to embodiment, that we're really talking about an evolutionary journey of mammals, and we are mammals, into a world of sociality where we have to interact with each other to enable our body to, in a sense, be embodied. And we'll go through this and we'll start talking about how our physiological state can distort or bias our acceptance of information from other perspectives. So many years ago, and uh, I read th this lecture by uh, uh, Snow, and it was called Two Cultures. I was either, I either read it in high school or when I was an undergrad, but I remember it and never forgot it. And it seemed almost like a, a, a pessimistic story of the separation of the basic sciences from the humanities. And, you know, I was always interested in, in the arts and humanities as well as the science. And I kind of saw this as how do you function within this complex world? Now, I'm going to tell you that it's much worse than he saw in 1959. It's a much worse situation. And what I, this is actually a quote from uh, something I wrote, which I found, and I would really like to share this with you because it was kind of my discussion of, of what I was feeling. And it is, I have spent my entire professional life in the academic scientific community, a community that takes a Tower of Babel approach to scientific inquiry. Often I felt that I was talking to illiterate primitives, although these individuals had doctorates from the major research oriented universities. At times I've struggled to understand the research questions of the other disciplines, and other times I have attempted to convey the most basic concepts of my research. I've struggled with communication and have searched for a common vocabulary and scientific metaphor. And over the years, I realized that if you could talk in a way that conveyed the intuitions of your research and your ideas, the acceptability of your ideas in the, with the masses was much, much greater. So this is the bias that we're living with now, in a sense of bias towards STEM disciplines uh, and applied programs. STEM is a shorthand for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It's interdisciplinary and applied approach. It is not transdisciplinary or shared disciplines. It's separation. And what we start learning, even in the biomedical or mental health areas, that when people use the term interdisciplinary, all they're doing is arguing for a place at the table. They're not, not arguing about sharing underlying principles. They're arguing for resources. Now, in university settings, we know the impact of a bias towards technology and, and science and application when it's done to the humanities. 
is basically diverted resources. The departments of humanities are starving, and that is they're not getting university resources. And even the relative salaries of people in those departments are much lower. In fact, we find in most universities, people who have faculty positions in the School of Business are doing as well as surgeons. They're making a very substantial salaries. Um, what's missing? It's missing is this uh, uh, understanding of our body and the embodiment, because what happens is when we're disembodied, we actually are disinterested in humanities. Missing is the understanding of our biology, our nervous system, and how our biology biases our emotional, mental, and behavioral processes, including our boldness, our insights, our creativity, aesthetic expressions, and even our spirituality. Our biology influences our capacity to accept and process novel informations and alternative models. Functionally, our biology determines or limits whether we can even be transdisciplinary, whether that is a viable concept to be shared because it's going to interact with our biology, our physiological state. And what it really means is that if our bodies are in states of threat reactivity, it will limit our intellectual and emotional access to novel information. And those of us who have lived in universities realize that universities are not the safest places. They are at places of chronic evaluation and our nervous system interprets evaluation as threat. So we have lost in discipline defined knowledge, the basic need to connect and truly cooperate with others. And that happens to be our biological imperative is to connect and cooperate. And this actually becomes one of the underlying themes of this talk. And if we don't have this connection, we will fail to appreciate the biases we experience when we are either feeling safe or threatened. So we become very focused on what we know in our niche, our tribe, when we're under threat. But when we feel safe, we get curious, we get bold, and we get creative. So this is like the uneducation of the educated. If we look at uh, the frequency or percentage of bachelor's degrees by major uh, colleges, in, by uh, discipline major in the United States in 2013, you see this high number on business. And you see that if we go to humanities and the liberal arts, which is what, uh, if we go back to the 60s when, or even the 70s, virtually everyone got their undergraduate degree in liberal arts, which really had some humanities, some science. In a sense, it created an educated person. That's now becoming a small segment of the undergraduate degrees that people are getting. They're getting degrees in applied areas, and in a way, they're not being educated. They're losing the history of humanity. And in a way, disciplines functionally uh, limit our understanding and our creativity, and they put us functionally in a prison. And I used to use the metaphor uh, of a prison to describe being a faculty member in a university. Now, this doesn't mean that being a faculty member in a university wasn't beneficial and useful, but it certainly wasn't building bridges across disciplines and allowing people to be creative and novel in their thinking. So we are functionally uh, uh, imprisoned and we have to break those chains. The metaphor that I use is that if we are interested in looking for principles that are not discipline based, but underlie all disciplines or most disciplines, we are functionally playing with a Rubik's cube. We're twisting it and we're trying to find across disciplines whether there's a common theme. And we can see really some relatively simple common themes that in the arts are perceptual facilities, how we see things, how we hear things, they're limited by our biology. So we start to see that biology. We realize that when we are threatened, our biology changes, our accessibility and flexibility changes, and we become different. So we start getting some general themes about our own biology and how it links to all these other disciplines. And what is in my mind missing is that we forgot that we are a biological organism, that we are biological, and that biology is a flexible biology that shifts states based upon threats or conditions in the environment or health conditions, and they influence 
how we take information in and how we judge that information. So creativity and productivity in both the sciences and the humanities are dependent on uh, the evolutionary history of human biology and the adaptive features of the human nervous system. And I wanna share this very powerful statement and that is our biological imperative is to connect and to cooperate, to collaborate. We as a species evolved, I should say uh, mammals survived as they evolved from ancient reptiles through their ability to cooperate and to share and to be safe in the presence of others. And that we have taken a misunderstanding of survival of the fittest. We think survival of the fittest is the strongest, that those who have the most resources and not those that can co-regulate with others and cooperate. So we can see that there is a science of sociality. We can just look at the newborn baby. And this is a theme that's shared across different mammalian species. And this is the ability for maternal behavior to trigger in the nervous system of the child, of the offspring, to give up all defenses so that the body can now support health, growth, and restoration. And it's not just giving up the child through the presence of being relaxed on the chest of the mother is enabling the mother to relax as well. So there's a co-regulation occurring. So I'm going to share with you a quote from Theodorus Dobzinski, who was an evolutionary biologist. And he made the statement that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And I want to take that statement and move it to other areas of the human experience and basically say intellectual products in the science, arts, and humanities make sense only in light of evolution. And I would all make this more global statement all human experiences are bounded and biased by our biology. So we can create organizing principles that are oblique or unrelated to our biology, but if we understand our biology as the foundation, it can help us create a more coherent transdisciplinary narrative. So this is the quote from Dobzinski. He says, the fittest may also be the gentlest because survival often requires mutual help and cooperation. And I think this is really way, when we start talking about transdisciplinary, we're talking about a shared agenda of understanding the human experience. Uh, what is this biological imperative? It's what living organisms need to perpetuate their existence. It's survival of the fittest, not the strongest, but those who cooperate and those who help each other mitigate their own threat responses and to co-regulate and to create. So connectedness is this uh, process uh, that we express this biological imperative. It's the body's need to co-regulate our biobehavioral state through engagement with others. Connectedness is the ability to mutually, synchronously and reciprocally regulate our physiological and behavioral state and optimize our social interactions. You see the term synchronous and reciprocal, and you realize that in our current culture, which is so digital and asynchronous and often lacks reciprocity, our nervous system is not getting the signals that support this biological imperative. So connectedness enables us to downregulate our defenses. And if we can downregulate our defenses, this is that journey to sociality. This is what made mammals survive, made them special. Connectedness provides that neurobiological mechanism to link social behavior with both mental and physical health, and also to creativity, intellectual uh, expansiveness, uh, and even spirituality. But the main point here is that our sociality is not a social behavior in itself. Our sociality is a bio behavior that enables behavior and our biology to regulate, to calm, to optimize its function. If we take from Star Trek a metaphor, feeling safe uh, enables us to explore, to be creative. However, if we have to use our uh, defenses, we use our resources. So in Star Trek was always putting up the energy shields the, to protect, but that 
uh, is costly. It takes energy and it takes energy away from intellectual pursuits. And I'm using energy as a metaphor because when our body shifts into these defensive states, our accessibility to interact with others, to learn from others, to exhibit a type of intellectual flexibility, to be respectful and to be compassionate of others, this is highly compromised. So the theory that I developed is called polyvagal theory. The name comes from poly meaning many and vagal meaning the cranial nerve and that mammals had a uniquely mammalian uh, vagal pathway that enabled them to downregulate defenses so they could become social. It was a journey to sociality. So polyvagal theory provides a theoretical basis for a neuroscience of safety. It explains how safety promotes spontaneous social engagement behaviors and health growth and restoration. It provides insights regarding the role of feeling safe plays in education, medical care, and social relationships. And I want you to think for a moment, if you're involved and interested in education, how many children have gut pains and other types of symptoms and don't want to go to school. These are merely signals of their autonomic nervous system that they're under states of threat. And what do we tell these children? We say, go to school, get over it. We're not respecting that their body is detecting threat. And because we have to really respect the fact that if our body feels safe, that leads our minds, our mental capacities to be creative and to develop bold new ideas. And it also acknowledges that the chronic evaluation in our educational model triggers costly threat reactions that limits our productivity. And if we think about universities, which are really a model of chronic evaluation, we could say that we have this resource and what are we doing with this intellectual resource? Are we supporting it or are we compromising it? So the models that we use for evaluation compromise how our nervous system works in an intellectual pursuits. We can also apply the same model to medicine. Medicine has become a discipline of evaluation and assessment. How does our body react to evaluation and assessment? It goes into threat reactions. So do you go to a physician to learn about your body, to develop a strategy for health, or do you go to your body, go to the physician and leave in a state of fear, not knowing what to do, assuming that there's that you have some type of deterministic and even fatalistic uh, injury or disease. So the theory that I developed uh, was, as I said, was called polyvagal theory. It was my presidential address to the Society for Psychophysiological Research. The title of the initial paper is actually functionally an abstract of what the theory was about. It was about orienting in a defensive word, meaning attending and engaging. And this is what mammals had to do. But to do this to survive, they had to repurpose their evolutionary heritage. They had to modify the neural pathways that they had inherited from their reptilian ancestors. So the theory is really uh, a part of, it describes an evolutionary journey to sociality. And what I want to do in this talk is elevate sociality as something that is extraordinarily important in our ability to regulate our physiology and to be creative. All vertebrates have a nervous system that detects threat and reflexively defines, responds to defensively. However, unlike our reptilian ancestors, mammals have a nervous system that detects safety and reflexively calms. This is a powerful piece of knowledge. It means that if we send the right cues to our, to our, our family, our colleagues, our students, our children, their bodies will move out of states of defense and they will become more accessible, both emotionally, physiologically, and intellectually. Depending upon the physiological state we're in, we are either socially accessible or we're defensive. Our physiological state influences our accessibility to new perspectives and information. And this needs to be a kind of underlying theme within the strategy of transgenerational studies. Our physiological state determines whether we can even think in a transdisciplinary perspective or whether this is, it's viable for us to encourage certain people to think that way. This is 
a diagram of the autonomic nervous system. It's uh, the nervous system that regulates the organs in our body. Uh, some of you may know terms like the sympathetic nervous system, which is a set of pathways coming off our spine. It, uh, it basically is functionally thought about, thought of as an accelerator. It affects these organs of our body to help get more energy out from it. And then juxtaposed to that is a parasympathetic nervous system uh, with, with the primary influences coming from a nerve called the vagus. And this is going to similar organs and in a way they serve, uh, the old model was a paired antagonistic model. But polyvagal theory says that may be partially true, but we react to the environment in a different way. We react with two different vagal pathways because mammals have a, have a second one. They have a, a vagal pathway that goes to the heart and lungs. And this one in the brainstem is connected to the nerves that regulate our facial expressions, our vocalizations, and even whether we can extract human voice from background sounds. So when this ventral vagus is working, it's downregulating the sympathetic defenses. However, we have a more ancient vagal circuit that goes primarily below the diaphragm. And this one can be recruited in defense, and that's why you start getting threat-related gut problems. And many people with trauma histories have severe subdiaphragmatic uh, problems, organs below the diaphragm. And this gives you that little journey of the autonomic nervous system. And this is our phylogenetic uh, journey of who we are as mammals. And when we reach and become mammals, we have this newer ventral vagal circuit that creates a ventral vagal complex that's linked with the nerves regulating the muscles of the face and head, producing a social engagement system that enables us to calm, but also enables those that we in interact with to be calm by us through that reciprocity. And the more primitive systems are the sympathetic uh, nervous system and this older dorsal vagus, and they have different functions, which we'll learn about in a moment. The head, the cranial nerves regulating the muscles of the face and head linked to that newer mammalian vagus, which calms us, is really our nervous system of social communication. But when that system is ineffective in moving us into a state of safety or uh, helping us survive, we take that system off. We retract that one so that we have an efficient system to mobilize, to fight or flee. So fight or flight becomes a very prevalent defensive system, and that's being regulated by the sympathetic nervous system. And if that system doesn't serve to move us into a safe place, we immobilize, and this is really regulating our visceral organs, and this is that dorsal vagal complex. So our heart rate drops, uh, we have, uh, uh, could have diarrhea, our gut may hurt. So we start going into physiological states that are... Uh, Evolutionarily, were conservative for reptiles. And when reptiles were under threat, they immobilized. And with mammals, when they immobilize under threat, it's potentially lethal. So the uh, polyvagal theory really provides these emergent properties of physiological states really kind of outlined in this figure. We live in an environment where we are bombarded with cues from inside the body and outside the body. And our nervous system evaluates that information through a process that is called neuroception. Uh, neuroception basically says these cues are safe, they're dangerous, or they're life-threatening. It's not a perception, it's so rapid. So like if you step into the street and you hear a, a car horn or brakes being uh, squealing, your body reacts. You don't know what the stimulus was until after you already, already reacted. So neuroception occurs so rapidly to save us and to put our bodies into different physiological states without a conscious evaluation. So it's not perception. So when we get cues of safety, our faces become more animated, we make eye contact, uh, our voices become more prosodic, meaning they have more intonation. And as this beaming face and the social interaction occurs, the same neural pathways are supporting how our gut is working. So we are supporting our homeostatic visceral needs through our social interaction. And in fact, when many of us are under threat, how do we mitigate those threat responses? Through social interactions with others.
If we get cues of danger, we turn off that social engagement system and we mobilize, we go into a fight flight mode. If we're overwhelmed by, let's say, a large, if we're a child and we're overwhelmed by a large adult, our body gets triggered to potentially a life threat reaction and we may totally shut down, we may pass out, we may, in a sense, immobilize in a state of defense, a very primitive reptilian reaction. And we can see that reaction in the mouse, in the jaws of the cat. And you can see the body of the mouse has lost all muscle tone because muscle tone requires sympathetic activation. So the body just shut down. Children can be so scared that they can pass out and they can literally defecate. And people who have been severely abused, this is actually a description of how they have responded to their abuser. So immobilization as a defense strategy is really not frequently talked about within psychology or psychiatry. They focused on fight flight because they couldn't understand the mechanisms of shutting down. But polyvagal theory basically explained it as this evolutionarily older system of the vagus. They were in this conflict. How could the vagus, which had been viewed in the literature as a system that supported health growth and restoration, how could that same nerve be used in defense? Polyvagal theory clarified that and identified how it worked. And we can see mobilization uh, for fight and mobilization for flight. And we can see how this social engagement system is working because looking at the picture, we see the upper part of the face, the facial nerve of this muscle called the orbicularis oculi sending cues between the, the child and the adult of safety and enjoyment of interaction. But it's not merely the facial expressivities. The underlying physiology is changing to support health growth and restoration. And we can see these face-to-face -face interactions in a mother-child, peers, uh, a primate with, with her offspring. And we can even see this face-to-face co-regulation in a trans, a species relationship of a dog uh, with, with uh, his or her owner. So these face-to-face -face interactions are functionally neural exercises of the social engagement system, and they become features of therapy, but they also can be applied in the workplace and in education. So the notion of support through face-to-face, -face, through vocalizations, through gestures to support physiology. And we can see the, uh, the immobilization in this picture of the mother and the babies uh, calm in their bodies, but not requiring any high level of muscle tone or defensiveness, but can really appreciate their interactions. So, so we can have physical contact without, while immobilizing without fear. And this is really the optimal state to help us rest, relax, sleep, digest, and perform bodily processes. This state of intimacy enables feelings of trust, safety, and love, but it's a challenge for mammals because it requires safety and many individuals have a trauma history. If they have a trauma history, their bodies are telling their brains not to trust, not to be embraced, not to come in close proximity. So social behaviors are neural exercises that promote neurophysiological states that support mental and physical health. And these are exercising what I call the vagal break. And this is how that vagus can inhibit sympathetic and calm us down. And this is part of our social engagement system. Connectedness leads to a physiological states of safety and enhanced homeostatic functions leading to health, growth, and restoration. Histories of trauma and abuse lower the threshold to trigger defensive behaviors and that disrupt connectedness and the ability to co-regulate. Now, take a quick moment and ask the question, are our academic institutions traumatic? For those who have higher education, have degrees, uh, getting the degree, was it fun? Was it co-regulatory or were there features of trauma involved in or great fear and threat? This, I'm going to go very quickly through this little phase here, and this is to deconstruct what that social engagement system is. So we see the faces interacting, and we see that 
they feel good, meaning that their viscera is being supported. But let's peel that away and let's say that social engagement system is really the neural regulation through a variety of cranial nerves to deal with uh, muscles of ingestion, muscles of the middle ear, which are for listening, facial muscles, which are for expressivity, muscles of the larynx and pharynx, which is for intonation or vocalization, muscles of head turning and head nodding. And these are wired together in the brainstem with how we regulate our heart and our bronchi. So the features that we express are being regulated by the social engagement system. And in the brainstem, in an area called the ventral vapor complex, all these systems are talking to each other. That's why people who are, quote, anxious have flatter faces, less affect. That's why their voices are higher pitched. Uh, and that's why they may also have difficulty understanding what you're saying. So if you are in a, a discussion in which one person becomes anxious or feels threatened, they will have difficulty understanding what you're saying or literally even hearing what you're saying because the nerves regulating those structures are now changing their control to support fight flight behaviors initially. We can see that the facial nerve, which is regulating that orbital muscle around the eye, has a branch that's going into the ear where it regulates middle ear muscles. So when people look exuberant when you're talking to them, they're able to hear what you're saying much better than if their faces are flat. So we, many of us have lived through, let's say an academic world where people will say to you uh, as they are doing something else that they're listening to what you're saying. Well, they're not listening to you in the same way unless they are looking at you. It's a different process. Not only that, if they look away from you and do something else, your body goes into a different state and your communication skills get compromised. So our neurobiology actually underlies the development of music and how music triggers in our body either a state of a calmness and a wonderment or whether it triggers mobilization. Likewise, architecture can create healing spaces or spaces that are agitating to our body. So neuroception is this neural evaluation of risk in the environment uh, without awareness. It's a reflexive system. Uh, reactions to threat are processed via neural circuits shared with all our, our, virtually all our phylogenetic vertebrate ancestors, yet reactions to safety cues are uniquely mammalian. So moving into this theme of embodiment, we have to understand that our body is on a mission. It's on a quest to be safe. And we are evolved. We evolved with, I've used the term, feature detectors to detect cues of safety, which can be intonation of voice, gesture, facial expression. So our neuroception is literally our personal TSA agent. And if we carry with us a trauma history, the threshold to be defensive is going to be manipulated, it's going to be lowered. If we are more resilient, if we have safety in our lives and we have good relationships and co-regulation, the threshold to react just gets raised and we become a more resilient individual. In the world of transdisciplinary studies, what that means is that if our body is in a sense safer, we're interested in alternative models and views. We are basically interested in becoming transdisciplinary. If our bodies are in states of threat, we are not. Anything that breaks our expectations of what we already know is now a threat to us. So we can see if our social engagement system doesn't work, and this is your little exercise to think about your friends and colleagues, about their voices, because if our body has been under chronic stress, which is threat, or we have different uh, terms, we have a trauma history or we have a mental health diagnosis, don't worry about anything specific. Just think that if our body is under a state of chronic threat, what happens to us? We lack intonation in our voice, we have poor eye contact, difficulties in social communication, blunted facial expressivity, difficulties in regulating our behavioral state, we become hypervigilant, anxious, distractible, impulsive, we may have tantrums, or we may become totally hypoaroused, meaning we withdraw and may even dissociate. 
and we have a compromised vapor regulation that could be manifest in cardiac arrhythmias or digestive problems. We would have difficulties listening to verbal commands. We could have speech and language delays. We would have sound hypersensitivities. We might be oral motor defensiveness, which means we're selective eaters with ingestive problems. Uh, limited co-regulation and cooperation with other people and reduce creativity and intellectual integration because creativity and integration violate expectancy and expectancy for many people is a metaphor for their safety. So what does our society do? Does it do a good job uh, creating access to our social engagement system? Do we have sufficient opportunities to exercise the system? What about email and texting? What is that doing? And the bottom line is, are we wasting our creative intellectual resources by supporting states of defense? Is this creating chronic evaluation which moves our nervous system out of its safety zone. Even in the world of spirituality, we have to think about if we're embodied, if we're safe within our body and we're connected with others, we have a pathway to spirituality versus the pathway of detachment and dissociation. These lead us to different conclusions about our own personal spiritual experience. So the theory transforms the human narrative from a documentary emphasizing events and objects to a pragmatic and often heroic quest for safety with the implicit bodily drive to survive emphasizing feelings. Now, in a transdisciplinary world, polyvagal theory takes information from many different disciplines, pathology, ontogeny, adaptation, phylogeny, which are common themes within the transdisciplinary world. And we can see that within polyvagal theory, it's reaching over to medicine and health sciences, neuroanatomy, psychology, evolutionary biology, speech and hearing sciences, and comparative and developmental physiology. And we are now learning in the sense that the applications are moving into mental health therapies, healing sounds and music, institutional organizational models, in information on how to shift education, treatments for auditory processing deficits, pain treatment models, health-related assessments, and healing spaces, meaning architecture. So we can see that the theory is truly transgenerational, both in its basic background and also more so now in its applications. And we have to think that collaboration uh, leads to creativity and safety is the substrate for collaboration and collaboration is part of our biological imperative. I want you to think uh, really that a lot of this information has been available, but not in a sense integrated. So in medicine, Walter Hess got the Nobel Prize in 1949 for a integrated perspective of a brain body system. And basically the quote from the first sentence of his speech is truly transdisciplinary. He says a recognized fact which goes back to the earliest times is that every living organism is not the sum of a multitude of unitary processes, but is by its virtue of interrelationships of higher and lower levels of control an unbroken unity. This got no traction in contemporary medicine. It was just oblique to their thoughts. So uh, the basic summary is that once we respect our biological basis, it leads to a transdisciplinary approach. Being in a physiological state of threat or chronic evaluation limits acceptance of other discipline defined knowledge and insights. Being in a physiological state of safety promotes accessibility, cooperation, and connectedness, and opens portals to other discipline defined knowledge and insights. And I, to end, I'd like to, in a sense, uh, say what would happen if Descartes were polyvagal informed, would he have said, I think therefore I am, or would he have used the reflexive term of saying, I feel myself, therefore I am. Thank you.